Church, appreciate each and every one of you. This morning, appreciate you being here, and I uh, trust something be said and done that be a help and blessing to uh, each and every one of you. If you have your Bible, please you turn to First Thessalonians chapter number four. First Thessalonians chapter number four, and John chapter number fourteen is what we'll be trying to preach from this morning with the Lord's help. Uh, great desire to be that you would know him today as your Lord and Savior. several times uh, since the pandemic has come in and hit, and, uh, and I was just looking at it a bit different this morning, and uh, we went in a different direction, and uh, had some things kind of, kind of jump out at me when we came in and talked to Wednesday night uh, after church, and uh, it's just kind of been uh, well on some things we talked about, and well on scriptures and things like that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're thankful today that uh, God's still on the throne. We're thankful that he is uh, alive and, and well today. Amen. And, you know, the, the, the thing about it is, and what we, we've always got to got to remember is we, we can rejoice today because Jesus Christ died and he rose again. And that's the salvation that we face upon the death, burial, resurrection. Of our Lord and Savior, and when I look at this scripture, this is uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is what our foundation is on, and it's on that right there. It says Jesus Christ had died, and that was the end of it. He had just been a man, mm -hmm. uh, but he did. He rose again. Uh, amen. And, uh, we can we can rejoice in that. Those of you that are in here with us this morning, if you would please stand. If you found your place, First Thessalonians chapter number four, and John chapter number five. I'm going to read out of uh, John, or John chapter number 14, I'm sorry, John chapter number 14, I'm going to read just a few verses here tonight, in John 14, and then read out of uh, First Thessalonians chapter number 4, uh, the Bible says this, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you uh, to myself, that where that where I am, there ye may be also, and whether I go, uh, ye know, and the way ye know. And then here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says this, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this cause, or for this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for allowing us here this morning. Lord, I just pray that thy will would be done, that each and every one that's here this morning, Father, would get exactly what it is that they need, whether it be encouragement or whether it be conviction, fall on their heart in life and show them uh, their need of salvation if they're lost, that would show them. Uh, if they're saved, Father, maybe show them uh, a place that they have erred in their life. God, I pray that you would help me as I stand. God, would you bring our studies, our thoughts to remember to you give them to us. Lord, I pray you touch our heart, our lips, and Father, everything that's said would come from the throne room of God today. Lord, I thank you for saving their soul. I thank you for giving us the strength to stand in it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Thank you for standing. I you that are really here. Now, as we look at these scriptures this morning, you say, well, those are two completely different scriptures. Well, they are, but I think they can be tied together uh, uh, fairly easily when you look at uh, first, or John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he says here in verse number 13 of First Thessalonians, but I will not have you, brethren, or I will not have you either, for brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not. And look what he says in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then which are asleep in Jesus, Jesus will God bring with him. So we understand here, when you start to look at these two uh, passages of Scripture, I believe that this is Christ here in chapter number 14 of the book of John. And he is, he is basically saying the same thing then that's being said by Apostle Paul here to the church of Thessalonica. He says that he wouldn't have you to be uh, rather now, you know what? Ignorance is not necessarily uh, a bad thing. Ignorance, a lot of times, that uh, you might say, well, that person's ignorant, and we take that as an insult. Really, what ignorance means is you don't know. Uh, you simply don't know. We think about uh, folks that come in and out the doors of the church that may not know something or don't know uh, don't know anything about the Bible, don't know anything about the Lord. That's the type of people that we want to bring into the church because we want to teach them. And we want to educate them uh, on the work of Christ and what he done. Uh, there's a lot of folks that's out there that don't know. And just because you've been raised in the Bible Belt, you might have been raised in church, you've been raised in a Christian home, you've been raised around Christian people, and that's always been talked about. And you think, well, everybody should know that. Uh, but it's a simple fact today that everybody uh, don't know about it. So when we look at this scripture here in 1 Thessalonians, we see something here uh, that just really jumped out at me. Now when I look through verse 13 and through verse number 18, I see the fact that he is talking to those of us that are born again. He's talking to those of us that are saved uh, by God's grace. And we can rejoice in that we have hope when you look at John chapter 14. You, what do you look at when you see that? I see hope there that because I'm born again, because of the work that Christ done, and I accepted him that day that he offered me salvation, I have hope and where he is, that's where I am going to be. Amen. You know, we got to realize today that our salvation is, is for eternity. It's as eternal as eternity right. is. Uh, if there's something precious about it, it's, 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 it's forever. And you must understand that this morning. Now, when you look at this here in verse number 13 of 1 Thessalonians, I, I want you just to, I'm going to try to slow down, and I want to try to, to share with you uh, how God has spoke to me on this. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to the church, talking to those of us that are saved. You know, because he calls us brethren, all right? I would not have you to be ignorant. And he's, he's wanting them to not be concerned. He's not wanting the church, because there was questions with the church of Thessalonica. You know, what happens if so-and-so dies? Uh, you know, we don't have a full understanding of what you're teaching us and what you're preaching. We believe it, but we don't have a full understanding. So he said, I don't want you to be ignorant about those that, are, that have died. Uh, uh, when you stand before a, a funeral or you stand there uh, before someone or you stand before family for a loved one that's died, Let's not be ignorant about the situation that they're in. But he goes on right here and he says this, concerning them which are asleep. So don't be ignorant about those that have died. And when you say, well, he's talking about the sleeping ones. Well, he also said that about Lazarus who was dead and had been dead for so 
sometimes. He said he's not dead, he's sleeping. And what happened? He kept walking out of there. So we know that he's talking about those uh, that have went on uh, out into eternity. And he says that you saw her not. Be not heartbroken. Be not poor. Hey, it is hard. We, we have loved ones and we're heartbroken over those loved ones uh, when they go off into eternity. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's so great if they have a testimony that's left behind. If they don't, it makes it so much harder uh, to see that. But it goes on right here, and he says that you sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. And I want to preach this morning on those that have no hope. Now, when I look at this, I see those things. I see how that Christ died for me. I see that I, because the work that was done on Calvary, he sent the Holy Ghost of God, and the Holy Ghost of God revealed to me my lost situation or my lost condition, and he spoke to my heart and showed me how to be saved. And you know what? I asked him into my heart and life. Now, when I read this, I know that one of these days, whether I go to the way of grave or whether we go to the way of the rapture, that I want to be forever in heaven with him. I know that this morning as I stand before you. And you know what? We can comfort one another with those things. Amen. We can comfort one another. Hey, there's nothing greater than the testimony of the saint of God uh, before they go off into eternity and they say, Preacher, will you preach the funeral? And you can stand here and you can say, Oh, by their testimony, by their life that they lived and the love of God they had in their heart, we know that they're in a far better place than we can ever be, than we are in here uh, today. But as I look at this, I, I want you to think about something. I, I was reading after an author and, and, and I wanted to share some of the, the thoughts that he got here. And it was, to me, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of uh, comical in a way because he starts talking about how that Christ, uh, when Christ died and, and, and how he died for, for our sins, how that some folks take that for granted. There's probably all of us sitting here this morning. We take it for granted that Christ died for me. Hey, I, I know that he died for my sins. I know that I can, uh, can trust in him and I can live forever. But, you know, we don't take the best advantage of the situation. We, have, we don't appreciate it. The appreciation factor runs out pretty quick when we think about eternal life. We see somebody that's in a ditch. We see somebody that's on drugs. We see someone that's on alcohol. We see someone that's living in sin that's in a mess and their heart will break and they say, oh, why won't they know Jesus? Why won't we live for Jesus at a greater capacity and maybe they might see him in us? And, you know, we're always wanting fame. Everybody wants to want fame than everybody else. But, you know, we ought to all examine uh, what we have deep down in our heart. You think about a philosopher at a funeral, what they're going to do, they're going to try to give everybody uh, to make everybody feel good about the situation. You take a scientist at a funeral, what's a scientist going to do? Well, I trained the doctors the very best I could. I give, uh, we give you the very best medical equipment we possibly could. Uh, if I had a way, uh, and, and I can't stand here, they cannot tell you how to bring somebody back from the dead. They can't do it. But then you see those that have the hope. You see those that have hope in Christ. We see those that, that trust in Him today. And when you stand over someone and they pass away, or we deal with a family and someone has passed away, what you start to see is you can see a little glimmer in their eye. They're brokenhearted. They're hurt. Uh, that they've lost that loved one because they're not physically with us anymore. But you know what? You can always see through that and you can see, but I know one day there's a better day ahead when I won't have to say goodbye to that loved one anymore. See, I have that hope this morning that if I die here, I know where I'll be. And I want you to know that as a testimony for me this morning. If I leave here, I'll be forever in heaven with the Lord. And I hope you'll meet me there. But there are some folks today that simply do not have the hope that we have. And we were talking there the other night. And... Uh, uh, Wednesday night, me and Brother Rick, that's, that's some of the men, I can't even remember who all was back there. And we were talking about the fact that one day, the last soul will be saved. One day, the last one is going to be saved. And I've had that on my mind a whole lot. And I've challenged myself since Wednesday night to try to have a desire to preach like I'm preaching to the last soul to be saved. Amen. There ought to be a seriousness about it. There ought to be a concern about it. And you know, you may be saved here today, and you may be the last one to get saved. Now, I'm thinking about how folks have, have, have been raised in church. I was a lost church member. I was raised in church. I knew about just about everything that I could know 
number 16 and verse number 23. Uh, we see the story of Lazarus and the rich man. I mentioned that a lot. I preached on it a lot, and I'm not going to go over there. But I want to take that, that truth from the Bible this morning, and I want to try to help you uh, to see those that have no hope. You've got Lazarus, who the Bible said was poor. He was homeless. He laid at the rich man's gate. And he begged him for bread. He was in such bad shape that he had sores and boils on him. And what happened? The dogs would come and they would lick that sore. They would lick that ball. And he was just in such a shape. I don't even think he could fend them off when they come around. He was in such a sad shape. And you say, well, that poor man, yeah, hey, man, that poor man, I hate to see anyone suffer. I hate to see anyone in a position that they would be that way. But it, it, it happens and there's folks that are that way. But deep down, Lazarus wasn't looking to the rich man. Lazarus had done made something, uh, made arrangements at some point in time because the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse 4 to 23, I believe it is, that when he died, he was carried by the angels of the Abraham's bosom. Amen. He was carried there, uh, and he was laid there, and you know what? No more sores. He wasn't hungry anymore. He had a cold. He had everything that he never had. So what is so much better? Uh, why are we fighting so hard to try and keep from turning our life over to the Lord and having the blessings of God added to our life? And when you see someone that was in that shape, that graduated, I'm going to call it a graduation, graduated to eternal life. And then we see the rich man. We see how he, the Bible says, I believe it says, it says like this, that he fared sumptuously. He never wanted anything. He never needed anything. Matter of fact, he snapped his fingers and pointed and everything was brought to him. Everything was given to him. And he died also. And the Bible said in hell he lifted up his eyes. In hell he lifted up his eyes. See, that might be two or three. And I, I, I want you to try not to imagine with me. But there might be two or three that's just teetering. Maybe God's been dealing with your heart for some time. And you put him off. And you put him off. And you put him off. And you know, there might be another one here. And you put him off. And you put him off. And you put him off. Matter of fact, there might be another one on the other side of the world that had put him off. There might be some on the West Coast that have put him off. There might be some at the church down the road that's put him off. But see, here's the thing. There's going to be one last one. And when that one last one is, if you put him off and you're not the last one, you're going to spend eternity in hell. That's it. Because when he takes us out of here, the Holy Spirit of God is going with us. See, the Holy Spirit of God right now will pay as crazy as things are in America, as wicked as things are in America right now. As wicked as things are worldwide right now. The Holy Spirit of God is still keeping it under control. Right. Yeah. Amen. See, this is the thing. When we leave here, utter chaos will break out. See, you've got good versus evil. We've always had good versus evil. Always. And it's always kind of been balanced. Every once in a while, good will do real good, and then sometimes the evil is going to pull back. But it's always been. But see, when good's gone, evil reigns. You know, I look at the condition of our world, and I look at the condition of sin in our world, and how that sin does not bother us anymore. How that death does not bother us anymore. Right. You know, right now, and they say the rate is down. Right now in America, do you know that in America alone we're aborting 3,000 babies a week? Nationwide, 3,000 a week. That's 12,000 a month. We're filling heaven up with souls and little babies. Been that way for years and years and years. You look at the condition of mankind. We've got 
out and scarred. Our conscience is seared as a hot. Nothing bothers us. Sin doesn't bother us. Hey, we'll look at it. We'll laugh at it. We'll make fun of it. We'll laugh with it and everything else. I'm telling you, we are in the last days. I'm preaching to right. someone this morning. Amen. You could be the last Amen. one. What if you were the one when you bowed your knee to the ground? God took us all. Yeah. Amen. 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 What you said to me. God's deal with your heart. You know what? I've said this a lot of times. I want to say it. I want to say it again. Because I didn't, I was not near as scared of being lost until after I got saved. After I got saved, it scared me to death to know that I was one heartbeat away from hell. Amen. One heartbeat away. One car accident. One trip and fall and hit your head. And it scared me to death. And you know what? We ought to be, and folks ought to be running to the altar today where they can understand and see the position that they are in and how, how close eternity is. I look on down here and I start to see some other things. In verse number 1 of chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, it says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you for you, for yourselves, know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief. You know, I'm not even concerned. I'm concerned about his coming. I'm not prophesying for his coming. Because this is the thing I know. He's coming. I don't need to know anything else. I know the first. See, we got to look at Apostle Paul as he wrote this down. You know, he even included himself as we which are alive and remain. He was looking to see the rapture at that time. And he thought things were a mess. But when we look at how things are right now and what a mess we are in, how it has continually gotten worse and worse and worse in a fashion way. The church is no longer looked up to. The church is no longer respected. Christians are mocked and made fun of. And we're starting to see a repeat of what happened to the early church as they were persecuted. We're starting to see that. And you say, well, I don't think we'd ever see that again. Hey, I, I, history repeats itself. When you look at this and I start to see, I'm not concerned about when he comes because I'm ready to go. Amen. I just know he's going to come. I look at verse 3 and it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them and prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Everything's going to be safe. Everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be calm. You know, the love of God not coming out of us. It should flow from us. And you know, Lord, help me that it would flow from me. Lord, help me that somebody would see it in me. Hey, I get so much on my mind. I get so much that I think about. We all do. We deal with life. We deal with things. We're concerned about our children. We're concerned about this one. We're concerned about that. And what it does is it robs us inside of the glory of God coming out of us right. to radiate into the world. Amen. And we need, we need more light now in our world than we've ever needed. Right. We need somebody to stand up and smile. We see that we need somebody to stand up and say, tell people that God loves them. Hey, we are the light of this world. Right. Yeah, we'll talk about that here in a minute. He says, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that the day should overtake you as a, you know what? I'm expecting it. So I shouldn't be surprised by it. Right. I'm expecting it. So I'm not going to be surprised when it happens. Now think about that a minute. When you're expecting something, 
you're expecting nothing, go back. And you're expecting, you might say. If somebody knocks on the door, you don't go to and say, Woman, who left it? <laughs> you hear a door shut outside. They're here. Why? You're expecting, what time do you want us to come? About 36 o'clock. All right, 5 30, they're not there. Well, they're not here. About 36 o'clock is what we said. That's 30 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. 5.45, you hear a door shut. Who would that be? <laughs> no, what you're expecting. So you're not surprised when they... So as the church, we need to be expecting it. So don't be surprised. Well, preacher didn't tell me he was coming. Hey, preacher, you've been telling me for 10 years he was coming. He is coming. <laughs> but it goes on and it starts to talk about us being overtaken like a thief. You know what? It's the same ones which have no love. Because they're not looking. There's some of you here this morning, you're just simply not looking. There's some of you outside in the parking lot, you're simply not looking. There's some of you that's watching on Facebook, you're just not looking. And because you're not looking, for, you have no hope. Listen to me. I love you. I care for you. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I have no hope. In the things of this world. Right. All right. I have no hope. I've got wishes, but I have no hope in our politicians. Right. None. Okay? They're not going to solve this. Right. They're not going to fix this. Mm -hmm. This is exactly how God said it would go, and that's how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe they can prolong it. I do believe that, hey, we've seen it through the judgments of, of the children of Israel so many times. Hey, what happened? They'd be an evil king, good will come along, God preserve judgment a while, and fall back into iniquity. Oh, what happened? They'd get judged. I don't have hope in the my hope is in the blood of Jesus Christ and no one else. It's not the evil one in this world. Right. right. You can't have hope in this world and have hope in Christ. I'd like to see things better in our world. I'd like to see people love each other. I'd like to see our country get along. I'd like to see no homeless people. I'd like to see no hungry people. I'd like to see where people get to the place where we just see each and each every person as people and not color, not race, not nationality. Not, hey, I want to see that. Amen. But I don't have much hope in it because it's human. But our hope this morning, if you have any hope of a better day, if you have any hope of a better life, if you have any hope this morning of a time when you won't tire, of a time when you're not frustrated, of a time when you, when you don't worry, you're going to have to put your hope in Jesus Christ this morning. Amen. You know what it is. There's so many we put our hopes in our bank account. We put our hopes in our home. We put our hopes in our knees. We put our hopes in the things that we can physically touch. If you can physically touch it, if you can physically manipulate it, if you can physically control it, it's not hope. That's right. It's not hope. Hope is being as sure of something as it can happen. You know what? I'm sure. I ain't took a drink of this, but I'm sure that's water. I'm sure. And I hope, from my experience, if I get thirsty, that will quench you. When your soul gets thirsty, your soul gets hungry, 
You desire something inside of you. There's something inside of you. I don't care what you say. There's something inside of you that wants better. Have you ever met a drunkard or a, or a, a drug addict that don't want to not stop? Have you ever met someone in that situation? And you say, well, this sweet hey, you don't understand. Right. And I understand this this morning because I was lost and I didn't have an understanding of how serious it was. Until that night, brother man, I got home. And I laid down in the bed and I felt different when I laid down. And you know what it done? It scared me because I realized how close I was Amen. to being just like the rich man and left in my eyes in hell. I can promise you the rich man did so this thing. Because he looked over there and there was that man and he stepped over. That man and he threw his strap down in the street. No sores, no hunger. He was carried by the angels of the Abraham bosom. The rich man sees that. And he starts saying, hey, Lazarus. Lazarus, would you just drip or dip your finger? In water. One little drop. It's still on there. One little drop of water that it may cool my tongue. And I'm going to tell you something. This right here on a hot day. Still hanging on there. On a hot day has never cooled nothing. But in hell, there are millions of people right now that would give anything they could have. For that little bitty drop of water that is hanging off the end of my finger. Right. Hanging on there. Can you imagine that one that would be under it? We look at that, we don't flick that off my finger, that's just a drop. But can you imagine how it it's precious because there's not any. Right. It's a constant torment. As the worms crawl around, oh, can you imagine? Dying but never dying. No hope of coming out. No hope of getting better. No hope of waking up and being a bad dream. Maybe after a month or two, it'll get to where it's not as bad. You know, I've heard people that are sick, and I've heard people that are dying, and are so sick, and they say, I just wish I could go on. You think about that. Just wish I could go on. And how they are in hell this morning. I just wish I could go on. I just wish I could be no more. Your soul is eternal. Your soul is eternal. It'll eternally be in heaven. Or it'll eternally be in hell. Right. It's not going to quit. It's not going to go away. It's not going to burn away. I want, to, I want to read you this and start reading to you. To go. But there was a there was a, an atheist that uh, his name was Henry Ward Beecher. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Henry Ward Beecher was a preacher. And he was invited to an atheist club. And they said the president over that club was, his name was Robert Ingersoll. And Robert Ingersoll, they said, was brilliant. And he was an atheist. They had that club. And he went and they said that Ingersoll made a speech and said it was witty and said that it was unmerciful and said it attacked the Christian. Said that it attacked uh, the church and attacked God. And said, when he got done, he made this really, said everybody in there was on their feet clapping at the atheist man's speech. Then the preacher, Ingersoll looked over the preacher and said, you got anything you want to say? And the preacher stood up. And he said, if you will forgive me, this is a direct quote, if you will forgive me if I appear somewhat preoccupied. He said, but this evening, I witnessed something shocking, and let me tell you about it. I saw a blind man groping at the curbside, and I saw a young fellow offer to help him across the street. But just as he took the blind man's arms, a great hulk of a fellow came along and boxed the young man's ears and chased him down the road. Then he came back and seized the blind man's stick and beat him with it, then pushed him headlong in the mud, went on his way laughing. said the silence fell in the hall and Ingersoll jumped to his feet and he said tell me who the boy is show me the boy because it's in you man Said Andrew Saul looked at him and said, Who is it? And the preacher looked at him and he said, You. Because all these people, you just shoved them in the mud and you laughed at him. He goes on and he says, You're the man, listen to me. Man is poor, blind, and wretched. He has little enough to lean on as he goes through his life. Few will help him. So what do you do, Mr. Ingersoll? You come along, pull all the props out from under him, you rob him of his face, push him in the mud. You are the bully. See, we live in a time where people want to jump and they want to pull the face out. They want to take the church that's grounded. They want to pull the props out. They want to rob the church of being able to gather together as me. Right. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be just as honest as I can be. If you want me to leave when I get done, I will. But can you explain to me can someone explain to me why is it the ABC store in town has never been closed one time through our pandemic? Why is it that all these places that are essential can be shut down or can't be shut down? But the church of the Almighty God, this is where it all comes from. Right. right. You know what it is? Kicking the props out from under the church. Even, hey, I believe with all my heart, you may not agree with me, you don't have to, this is my opinion, but the church is foremost, the most essential thing that has ever come along in mankind. It is the most essential thing in the United States of America. I believe with all my heart, the remnant of the church is the reason that God has not destroyed us before now, and then we don't get a hold of what's going on around us. Folks, the hope this morning is in the church. Amen. The hope is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Amen.
devil knows how to work. He knows how to put people in the right places to work. I look out here and I see, I look in here this morning, and I look around and I see about 35, 40 people maybe in here. But in March, we had 135, 140. I can walk through the parking lot, I can't put 135, 140 together. They're not. Right. And what's happened is, is we, we've conned, we've said, you know, we'll just go ahead and we're going to accept it for just exactly how it is and what you're saying. And we're going to, we're going to, hey, look, I told you before, I know it's real. I know it's common sense. It's common sense to be careful when anything like this is going around. It's common sense right. when the blue's going around. It's common sense when the seventh boat is going around. It's common sense. And I ask you to use it this morning. Amen. But what I see is the church quitting on God. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. What I see is a place where people have decided, you know what, I can watch it from home and get just as much out of it. All right, you go to work. All right, you go to the grocery store. All right, you Great. go buy clothes at Walmart. Hey, you go shopping. Hey, I can go on and on and on. And you can turn me off. You can drive away. You can get up and leave. I don't really care. I'm just going to be honest Amen. with you as I can be this morning. People are slipping off into eternity and they're dying and going to hell. People quit caring. It gets harder every time I'm out to Bless him. I preached in here a couple of Wednesdays and not nights ago. It's the toughest time I've ever had in my life. I preach. Is he still God? Is he still on the throne? Amen. Are people still dying and going to hell? Right. Is he coming back? Yeah, man. Yes. Amen. Being mean, I'm not standing up here being hypocritical, but what I'm starting to see, and I've talked to a lot of other pastors, starting to see the same thing. People that's able to come in are not coming in. Uh, it's turning into a social event in the parking lot. Hey, listen to me. Hey, I want you to listen. I want you to be here. I want you to be in church. I want you to be in the parking lot of Amen. church. Stay in your car. Hey, if you can stay, in, if you don't have to stay in your car in the parking lot, you might as well come on in. Right. Was telling me, he said, I was preaching a couple weeks ago. There wasn't hardly nobody in the, in the church. And he said, I was preaching a few, few weeks ago. And he said, We don't have enough to build the church up anyway. And he said, I was preaching. And he said, The more I preached, he said, I started thinking, I want to go outside. He opens the door and he goes outside, preaching outside. He said, Now look, he said, Here's a little group of men huddled up, listening in the car with him. Standing around talking.
we are so as a nation, what would America do? Are you one of those today? Are you one of those that have no hope? This is me. My hope is not in two weeks from Tuesday. Uh, right. My hope Oh, 
who had called you, who had called you, who also will do. Then the preacher says he is ready to pray for us. Thank you. 